Now, as promised, I'd like to talk about a way to visualize the electric force, a very powerful conceptual way known as electric field. We can think of an electric charge as setting up an electric field, and then the electric, uh, then any electric charge will interact with the electric field around it, will be acted on by the electric field around it. Now, what this really is, acted, being acted on by the electric field, it's really being acted on by whatever the charge is that sets up the electric field. So it sounds like we're adding a middleman where we don't need one, but believe me, this really is going to help our understanding of the electric force, so bear with me. The electric field relates the electric force on an object to its charge. In this fashion, the force on the object is equal to the charge of the object times the electric field in which it finds itself. As you see by the arrows that I've put in here, force has to be a vector because force is a vector. Charge is not a vector, charge is a scalar. Electric field must be a vector because you multiply a scalar times something to get a vector. Well, that something has to be a vector. So in terms of the magnitude and direction of this vector, this is how this works. The magnitude of an electric field is given as the force in newtons on a plus one Coulomb charge. The direction is the direction of the force exerted on a positive charge. So imagine a positive test charge somewhere in space. The electric field tells us what the force exerted on this test charge would be, both its magnitude and its direction. So electric field vectors therefore must point away from positive charges and toward negative charges because a positive test charge would be repelled by a positive charge, so pushed away it will be attracted by a negative charge pulled toward it. The unit of electric field, well, what it has to be if the force is Q times field, and Q being charge in coulombs, then the field itself must be in newtons per coulomb. You multiply it by a coulomb and you get newtons. So now let's imagine that we have a positive charge that's being pulled to the right in an electric field, whatever that direction is. So it's pulled to the right. So if the field strength gets stronger, if the, if the field E is doubled, what happens to the force on the object? What happens to the force on this test charge? Does it drop to a quarter of what it was? Does it drop to a half? Does it not change? Does it double? Does it quadruple? Does it switch direction? Well, I hope you figured that the force is just going to double because the force is just the field times the charge. There's no powers or squares or uh, reciprocals or anything like that in here. I want to emphasize again that Newton's third law applies to the Coulomb force, applies to electric forces. Whether we're visualizing the forces as fields or not, Newton's third law still applies. So field notation is unilateral. We think of uh, it often as expressed in terms of a field acting on a charge. But forces are always between objects. So when we say a field acts on a charge, well, that field is set up by other charges. So it's what's really acting on the charge is the other objects that have set up the field. And the field of a charge does not affect the charge itself, does not pull or push on the charge, does not set up a force on the charge. It only acts on other objects, external objects. There's a couple ways to visualize electric fields. We can also express them mathematically, um, but it helps to do the visual and conceptual first. Two common ways are as field vectors, which is the most intuitive, and we'll start with that. But it turns out the most uh, useful way and the most powerful way is as field lines. And so we'll talk about field vectors first, and then we'll use our understanding of fields as vector diagrams to understand what field line diagrams mean. So this is an example of a vector diagram of a field. What this is showing is at these different points, all these dots, it's showing little arrows which would express the vector of the field. So 
the field you see is right is quite strong here to the left and it's pointing mostly directly to the right as we move to the right the field is diverging somewhat and it's also weakening the vectors are getting smaller the vectors are getting shorter and they're not all pointing to the right some of the ones at the top are pointing up the ones at the bottom are pointing down So how would you draw field vectors to describe the electric field of a single positive charge? I'm not with you, so I can't check this. Um, so hopefully this is an exercise we can do at some later time. But remember that the field must be very strong near the object because remember that inverse square of the force. And as we get farther away, the field gets weaker. And the field is always going to be pointing away from the positive charge, right? Because that's the direction of the force exerted on a test positive charge. That is going to be a repulsion. So the field vectors that you draw should always be pointing away from this charge. And as you get farther away, the vectors get shorter and shorter. This is the same electric field visualized as field lines. It looks like we're missing something here. We're losing some information because we don't have an idea of the magnitudes of the uh, field at e all these different points. But it's showing us better what the direction is. It turns out that there's a nice fancy trick. Actually, not that fancy. It turns out there's a simple trick that we can use to visualize the strength of the field as well as the direction of field entirely from these field lines. So let's explain how that works. The magnitude of the electric field, in other words, the magnitude of the force on a test charge, is greater where the field lines are closer together. So back to this diagram, we see close together, that's on the left, and farther apart is on the right, and that's consistent with what we remember seeing from the vector diagram, that in the left, the vectors were fairly long, that was a large magnitude, and in the right, the vectors are short, lower magnitude. So stronger field here, weaker field off to the right. The direction of the force is parallel or tangent to the field lines. So the force on a positive charge would be in the same direction as the field lines and along the field lines. On a negative charge, it would be opposite that. So again, here, these are the field line diagrams. Remember, the force vectors were this way. Well, that was, excuse me, the field vectors were this way. So a positive charge will be pushed away, but a negative charge gets the opposite treatment from a positive charge. So it's going to be pulled in the opposite direction toward uh, on the left in this diagram. So let's look at these four test points, A, B, C, and D, in this diverging electric field. If the green arrows are representing field lines, uh, we have particles at A, B, C, and D with the same charge. Which one gives us the greatest field? Would it be A, B, C, or D, or would they all be the same? How about this field? This is a uniform field. What that means is everywhere the field is in the same direction, and everywhere the field is the same strength. How do we know that? Well, the same direction because all the field lines are parallel. They're all moving in, in the same direction, or say they're all pointing in the same direction. And we know that the magnitude is not changing because the magnitude of the field, the strength of the field, is given by the distance between the field lines. And here, the distance between the field lines is the same. So what will we do for field lines to describe the field of a single positive charge? Well, that would just be lines pointing directly away from this positive charge. And we can see then from those lines that the farther you get away, the farther apart the lines are, which is entirely consistent with our understanding that the electric field decreases with distance from the charge that generates it. What about the electric field of electric dipole? Again, this is something that's probably best to do in class when I've actually got you around, um, but we know that charges are going to be positive charge. We know that positive charges are going to be repelled by the positive charge and attracted by the negative charge. So basically, to understand how to do this, we would add the field vectors together 
to get the, the vectors for the field from the positive charge and from the negative charge to find out what the vectors are at any point in space. And then we can trace through the field vectors to understand what the field lines do. So basically, we'll have lines going from the positive to the negative, from the positive to the negative, and they'll curve through space. A couple things to note on the midpoint, on the line directly uh, between these two, or bisecting the line between these two charges, if these charges are truly opposite, the field vector is always going to be a straight line to the right because it'll be pushed away and you know pushed up and pulled down by the same. So the vertical part is going to cancel and the horizontal part, uh, which is to the right, is going to reinforce. So that means that we'll always have our lines right at the midline are going to be momentarily uh, horizontal here. What if we have an infinite plane of electric charge? This one turns out to be very interesting. If we have an infinite plane of electric charge, that's uniform charge density, in other words, the same number of coulombs per area, per square meter, then we would have a uniform electric field. If this were a positive charge, then it would be a uniform electric field pointing away from the plate. If it were a negative charge, then it would be a uniform field pointing toward the plate. You can understand why it has to be uh, always pointing directly away or directly toward if this is an infinite plane, because all of the vertical components of the interactions with parts above and below are going to cancel out, and all it's left with is the horizontal component. Now I'd like to talk about shielding, which is something that a conductor does with electric fields that basically you cannot have an electric field inside a conductor, and I'll explain why that is. So imagine that you have a conductor in an electric field. Well, remember, in a conductor, charges can move, so the charges are going to move in response to this electric field. Positive charges are going to be pushed in the direction of the field. Negative charges are going to be pushed opposite the direction of the field, and these charges will then set up their own field. So in the sense of, if we remember the field of a uh, unit charge or the field of a positive charge, let's think back to our bag of uh, charges that can move. So the bag is essentially a conductor. And if we got a positive charge next to this bag, next to this conductor, then the negative charges in the conductor move toward the positive charge. The positive charges in the conductor move away from the positive charge. And they're going to move until there's no more force, right? Because there's, you know, until there's no more reason for them to move. So they'll rearrange until there's zero field inside the conductor. We can imagine if we have the uh, negative charges toward the positive charge and positive away, well, in between, the charges are, in between, the field is going to exactly cancel the external field from the external charge. Or the charges would move. So the charges move until the field cancels, and then it stops. So conductors exclude electric fields, and you cannot have a static electric field inside an electrical conductor. Pretty cool.